13D. You know the song, I think. I think you know it. <clears throat> but you can stand up and we'll sing it. If you don't know it, I'm going to sing it for you. say show me and I'll trust you he says trust me and I'll show you we say change me and I'll praise you he says praise me and I'll change you we say show me and I'll trust you he says trust me and I'll show you we say change me and I'll praise you he says praise me I'll change you hey do it one more time we say show me and I'll trust you he says trust me and I'll show you we say change me and I'll praise you says praise me and I'll change you. A lot of times we get that backwards, don't we? <laughs> hey, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. That's a good song to sing, isn't it? We're going to do it. Open the eyes of my heart. What page is the next page? Just flip it over on 15. If not, you already know it, I'm sure. Here we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see Let's do it one more time. Here we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your 
and we do tonight. Brother Chuck, if you would open us up in prayer, please. Yes. <laughs> it's a, one of the things that about music is amazing to me. Someone has once said that music is a universal voice. Uh, it does have a voice of its own. Certainly used a great deal in the Old Testament that, to attempt to glorify God and also to appease those who were listening. Remember David sang the psalm, played the psalm, played to Saul as he was in his temperamental stage, and maybe we could learn by that. You got somebody in her temperamental stage, call Miss Jan. <laughs> she can play for him and get that soothing kind of understanding that comes from music sometimes. Genesis chapter 41, pick up where we left off. Actually left off in verse 48. Pharaoh, that's amazing. I wonder how many modern Christians today would say if they didn't know the whole story about Joseph, but how to some would say, boy, I tell you what, that man needs to get right with God. Everything in the world's happening to him. And it's amazing how many people feel like if things go wrong, you know, something's got to be wrong with us. I don't know where we get that. We sure don't get it from the Word of God. Because I promise you, almost everyone who's ever served God in any extent has gone through some difficulties to do so. And it doesn't, it's not a matter of what the difficulty is. It's how we deal with the difficulty that God gets the glory out of it. And this is a, one of the most beautiful stories in the whole Bible to me. Joseph, a man after God's own heart, not in the truest sense that David was, but certainly a man who would prefer to be where God has allowed him to be or even caused him to be in many cases. And yet, when it gets down to the end of the road, I get so amazed every time I read it. Um, he is such a gracious person. After his brethren have done him the way they've done him, all the things that have happened to him, the opportunities that he's had to be Mr. Somebody, he did, rose to the greatest prominence that could possibly happen to a man. And yet it never, ever went to his head. It went to his heart. There's the difference between real spirituality, in my opinion, and people who just advance in life. So let's, let's begin. Let's finish up chapter 41 where we left. And Pharaoh now has made Joseph a ruler. He was a man that t adversity has happened. Remember, uh, he interpreted a dream for a baker and a butler. And, of course, the baker and the butler. Uh, one was released in one way and one was released in another. I would prefer the, uh, the butler's release than the baker, uh, as you well know. And, of course, he told the baker, Joseph did when he interpreted his dream, and he was released. He said, please remember me. Well, he did, but it was two years. See, God's timing wasn't right. It took two years for God's timing to match Joseph's desires. I'm sure he didn't want to be in prison any longer than he needed to be. But beginning in verse 48, what's happening here is Joseph has told Pharaoh's dream. He's interpreted Pharaoh's dream for him now. And he said, listen, you're about to have seven years of famine. You're going to have seven years of plenty first. And what we need to do is gather up all the, the goods that we have. He said, the land's going to produce more than it normally does. God is in control, of course. And we're going to take all, you need to take all of this, this stuff, this excess, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I know y'all don't ever think about this. What if we took our excesses and used it for God's glory? You say, well, I don't have many excesses. I don't. <laughs> you live in America and don't have excesses? I don't believe that. I think we all have some, amen? I think we have a lot of, probably a lot more than we'd like to think about. But when we do, if we took that and, and glorified God, I promise you God would be glorified and we'd be blessed in a sense of a spiritual blessing, not just... Every blessing is not a physical one. In fact, the Bible says all every blessing of God is in Christ Jesus. He's our blessing and our blesser. But I was thinking about this. He was saying, let's take all the excesses and put it up. And then when the famine gets here, then we'll be able to survive. And of course, Pharaoh said, oh my goodness, you interpreted my dream so well. Certainly nobody would understand how to do this any better than you would. So they chose Joseph, as you well know, to be a ruler and to take care of the very problem that existed. And so this is what's happening in verse 48. And he, Joseph, gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, 
which was round about every city, and laid he up in the same. He was laying them up in every, every place that he, I love the way he did this. Everywhere he gathered grain or, or excesses, he stored it in that location. And uh, so that the people that produced the food would benefit from it in that location. And that's implied in the way it was said. In verse 49, And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. And what I'm talking about, see, when God causes a bumper crop, it's a bumper crop, isn't it? It's without, beyond number sometimes, and that's what happened here. And in verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came. And Asenath, the daughter of, of Potphera, the priest of Onan, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget. And all my toil in all my father's house, this is what he was allowing Joseph to do because of the name of Manasseh. And verse 52, In the name of the second was Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of affliction. Of course, Manasseh means forgetful, and uh, I think that's part of what my parents named me, because I sure am sometimes, aren't y'all? And then, then it's fruitful, of course, that's Ephraim's name. And for God caused him or me to be fruitful in the land of my afflictions, he said. Verse 53 said, in the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Now, remember this, it's how we take care of what God provides in the plenty that takes care of of God's provision in the poverty. If America could learn that, and if we as Americans could learn that, we'd have missionaries on every field in the world. I believe that. I believe the blessings of God have been so much to this country that we've had so many opportunities to get the gospel to the world and have done so in many cases. But I think if we just took inventory of, and we can only do this individually, and then, of course, as a church, we have to make sure we do that. But I'm convinced that a church forgets, when we begin to forget that the plenty God supplies is not to be used just for this place. It's to be used for the world. Remember, he gave us a commission to carry the gospel to where? The entire world. So we have a tremendous responsibility. And when God uses things like this, we should take note of how God is working in Joseph's life and I believe that these particular kind of circumstances can work well in our own lives every day if we actually will take them and, and, and use them as a sense of understanding. And he says then in verse 54, And when the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said, and the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was what? Bread. Why? They obeyed God. They did what the dream said. They obeyed what the... Joseph said, do, and that was the voice of God. By the way, there's more behind in this, this than just feeding Egypt. You know that. You know the story, right? But let's continue in verse 55. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. If you remember reading that in the New Testament somewhere, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Mary said it. That's one of the few things I believe with Catholicism. That's one thing Mary said that I want to do. Whatever he says, do it. He was talking about Jesus at the wedding. And here we have another type of this, this, hey, he's in control. Go to him. Don't come to me. And the famine was over. All the face of the earth. And when you see a phrase like that, it's talking over all the face of the earth. It's talking about all the known earth at that time. And probably when we think about all the earth, I mean, we think about this cylinder we live on and all of the things that's there. And, of course, this particular had, had the idea of all the known earth at the time. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptian, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all the counties, or the countries, I'm sorry, all the countries, which again means the whole earth, came unto Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, now you know the story, Jacob's back here with his other sons, all 11 of them now, there's been Benjamin's been born. And so all 11 of them are back in Egypt. He, he believes, and uh, I believe that even the, the other, his, the brothers, 
uh, of Joseph. All believed that he was dead. Certainly he's dead. It's been almost 22 years now since they've heard her. And everybody, they looked for him. I'm sure they sent him out and looked for him. But since they brought in the coat that had blood, of course the guys, the brothers doctored up the, uh, the coat of many colors with blood of an animal. And they said, oh my, this must have been a wild animal attacked him and killed him. And you know that story. But now the Bible says in verse 2 of chapter 42, and he said, behold, I have heard, this is Jacob talking now, Joseph's father. There is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brothers went down. Now you realize there was one left at home. And you say that in the next verse. They went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, this was the other child by Rachel, went, Joseph's, Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. How do you think that made the other ten feel? Not much cared about us, Papa. Your favorites at the house. They still, you think they might still be remembering Joseph's son? When they say this is, you know, Joseph was his chosen at, the one, at, at one time. And of course, since Joseph now has been missing, Benjamin's become his favorite. I wonder how many of us sitting in this room would have to admit if you have more than one child that there's certainly been times that you favored one more than the other. It doesn't mean you love one more than the other. But, and I, I can hardly get parents to do that. They just don't want to be honest about it. But sometimes a certain child has, has a certain closeness to you maybe that the others don't have. Some are doing this, some are saying, I dare not move. <laughs> it happened sometime. It did here, of course. And, and that's one of the reasons it got Joseph into trouble. Not, not his father, but the, the children, his brothers knew how he felt about him. He made him the coat. And, of course, Joseph didn't help anything when he started interpreting his dreams, having dreams and interpreting them in his favor. And so, verse 5, the Bible said, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came. For the famine was the land of Canaan, of course, also. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And the word roughly there literally means he said hard things to them. So he was really being hard. And you say, well, why didn't they recognize him? I was concerned about that, and I did a little bit of study. And what, one of the things that happens in the land of Egypt, anyone who was in control or was like a governor over the land, normally they were always clean-shaven, and they shaved their head. So that could have had something to do with them not readily. Re First of all, I don't believe they would think they would find Joseph in charge of anything in Egypt. But he, God had a plan. And it always amazes me that God's plans hardly ever fits my expectations. What about yours? Isn't it amazing how sometimes it, what God does, you're just amazed at how this happened. But this is one of those things. But he said, he spoke strangely unto them and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, whence come ye? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them. And you remember the two dreams that got him into trouble. One of them, or both of them, had to do with them bowing down to him, one of them in particular. And about he was more superior than they, at least from his dream. And here's what he said. Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, You are spies to see out the nakedness of the land you are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land you are come. What he's saying, you're come to see how, how difficult our financial situation is so that you can go back and tell your people and they can come and attack the land. And, of course, this was Joseph's way of treating them the way getting to the end result. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren. They really had a lot of nerve bringing that twelfth one in there, didn't they? I can imagine Joseph said, You hope it's eleven. But twelve, twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day 
with our Father, and one is not. I put a little thing out there inside of my Bible says, you wish they're going to have to face the one that they thought that they had done away with now. And Joseph said unto them, that it is that I spake unto you, saying, you are spies. Hereby you shall be proved by the life of Pharaoh. You shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Now remember, this is Joseph's only true brother of his father and his mother. I got a feeling, and the Bible doesn't say, but this is just me. I got a feeling that one of the reasons he did this, he wanted to see that brother. I believe that was one of his heart things. He found out Benjamin's been born, and he wants to see this brother. So verse 16, he says, Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely your spies. Anytime he uses that phrase, by the life of Pharaoh, he was, it's like saying, based on the power of the throne, based on the power of the throne, the person in control, then you are spies. Verse 17, and he put them all together in ward, or in a prison, for three days. And Joseph said unto them, the third day, this do and live, for I fear God. This is Joseph speaking. If you be true men, let one of you, brethren, be bound. Let's go back to verse 18. Do you believe maybe that Joseph, that God was eating at Joseph's heart because he was being a little bit, no, a whole lot vindictive? You think, he said, I fear God. So what we're going to do, instead of uh, putting you all in prison and sending one, listen to what he said. If you be true men, let one of your brethren be bound. Well, that's a little bit better. In the house of your prison, <clears throat> go you and carry corn for the famine of your, of your houses. Wow, wait a minute. All of a sudden, he's saying, well, go back and make sure to take care of everybody but the one you leave with me. And we'll use him as assurance, that's assurity that you'll come back and, and prove yourself to us. So, verse 20, he said, But bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Now, I'm thinking when they said, Okay, we'll go, we'll go get this taken care of. What about Daddy? Remember, he didn't want to send Benjamin to begin with because something might happen to him. Now, Joseph is saying, If you don't bring Benjamin all of you are going to face the guillotine or whatever manner of death. Let's read. And so, and they said one to another, we are very guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us, somebody figured it out. The way we treated Joseph is why all this junk is happening to us. I'm amazed. I'm amazed that very few of us think that our sins will find us out. Most of us, you know that old saying, we want to sow our wild oats and pray for crop failure. They're going to come up. It's going to happen. And I believe they said, here, this is the reason we're having this kind of trouble. In verse 22, and Reuben answered saying, Spake I not unto you saying, do not sin against the child. Well, there's a message, isn't it? Don't sin against the child. And you would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake to them by an interpreter. Joseph is standing there listening. They don't know that he understands Hebrew. He's an Egyptian under normal circumstance. He wouldn't. But can you imagine him sitting there and saying, praise the Lord, they do remember. And God, you are working. You know, you're dealing with their hearts. And he turned himself about from them and wept. That just broke his heart to see his brothers admitting what they did because 22 years later, I mean, it might have been a long time to get to repentance, but it appears that God's really working in their hearts and their lives. He wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and restore every money into his sack. Now, here's what they'd done. They'd paid for the corn, the price of the corn. 
So while they were filling up the corn buckets, Joseph said, hey, take the money and put it back in every man's bag, the amount that he paid for. Now, that was good and bad. The first thing we'd think is, man, they got free corn. They, they're going to wish they didn't have free corn before it was over. But listen to what happened. And to give them provision for the way. He was doing it positive. He was doing it to say, I want to give them the corn and they can use the money to, to take them back home. And he says, for behold, verse 26, and they laded their asses with the corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass parvender, in the, in the end, he espied his money, for behold, it was in the sack, sack's mouth. When he opened the sack, the money kind of fell out or was seen. And he said to his brethren, My money is restored. And lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed, I guess. You know what the first thing, and it says, It failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? I'm amazed. They already admit that they were in trouble. If they'd admitted this 22 years ago, you'd say, why didn't they, why didn't they, wait a minute. God hasn't lost control of this circumstance. He started something that he was going to finish. And we look around and we, uh, we just can't see the providence of God until we see the fulfillment of it. Along the way, it's difficult to think something bad could be used for something good, right? Well, you know the story when he says, you know, they, you thought it evil to me, but God used it for good. That's where the saying came from. And so anyway, he said unto his brethren, and of course he was afraid. And in verse 29, and they came unto Jacob, their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell them unto them, saying, This man, who is the Lord of the land, spake roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. And we said to him, We are true men. We are no spies. Now, underline that word true men. It just literally means we're men of, 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 of moral upright. We're not spies. And I thought, man, you, if you, you've forgotten what you did to your brother. But anyway, that was the idea. And in verse 32, it says, We be twelve brethren. He's, what, he's recounting what he, they told the, uh, Joseph. Sons of our father. One is not. And the youngest one is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that there are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me and take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that there are no spies, but that you are true men. So will I deliver you, your brother, and you shall traffic in the land. And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. You know what they were afraid of? These guys skipped out, got the corn, took their money, and left. Good possibility of prosecution had it not been. This was, of course, Joseph's idea. And Jacob, verse 36, their father said unto them, Me have you bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. Simeon is not. And you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Can you imagine how a father or a mother would have felt in the same circumstance? I, when I first read this, sometimes I thought, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jacob. You, you can't see the end of it. And if I was in his shape, I couldn't have saw the end of it too. So I would have probably felt the same as Jacob had. And he felt that way, apparently. He said, it, all these things are against me. In verse 37, and Reuben, Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. Reuben was the one that spoke up for Joseph before, remember? He spoke up. He did not want to see his brother done the way they did him. In fact, they put him in a pit while he was gone and sold him while he was gone, while Reuben was doing whatever. Verse 38, and he said, My son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which you go, then you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Literally, he was saying, I'll die from a broken heart from this. If, if something happens to Benjamin, and I let him go with you, then 
I'm going to have a broken heart. Verse chapter 43, And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt. Their father said unto them, Go again and buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, You shall not see my face except your brother be with you. And if thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. His daddy was not like my daddy. If I'd have told him I wasn't going to do something. How many have ever been in that spot? Oh, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And anyway. For the man said unto us, here's, the reason, here's my reason. You shall not see my face except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dare you so ill with me as to tell the man whether you had me yet a brother? Why didn't you even tell him that we had a brother here? Well, it was in a common conversation, Father. I mean, we weren't thinking that we'd be in a, put everybody in trouble. And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state, of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel, his father, Send the lad with me. Now Judah steps up. Reuben is tried. Judah steps up. Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and thou, and also our little ones, I will be a surety for him of my land. Of, oh, excuse me. Of my hand shalt thou require him, if I bring him not unto thee. And set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. He said, this would have already been taken care of if you'd have just let us go when we first asked you. Verse 11, And their father Israel said unto them, Now he's called, being called Israel and referred to as Israel. If it must be so, now do this. Take of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey spices and myrrh and nuts and almonds and take double money in your hands the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks carry it again into your hand per adventure it was an oversight they may have just made a mistake so be sure you're prepared to take it back take your brother and arise go again unto the man this had to be a very tough decision for this father there's no doubt in my mind that he felt this might be the last time he'd see his second son gone and god almighty i love that word you do know that he's talking about el shaddai here that's the rendering and he says this is the man the god that will provide for you he is the supplying one and god almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and benjamin if i be bereaved of my children I am bereaved, simply said the way he said the last, I am bereaved, I'm a dead man. And the men took the present, that they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home and slay and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at, at noon. He said, Go kill the fatted calf, my words, but the idea get ready for this prepare we're going to feed these men at my house today at noon and the man did as joseph bade and the man brought the men into joseph's house and the men were afraid because they were brought into joseph's house and they said because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time we brought in then that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondage and our and our asses and they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house and said, O oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food, and it came to pass when we came into the inn that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, and we brought it again into thy hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell you who put our money in our sacks. And here the overseer said, Peace be unto you, fear not. I like this now, coming out of the mouth of an Egyptian. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. 
I had your money, and he brought Simeon out to them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house. He gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their asses provender. And they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him in the present, which was in their hand, into the house and bowed themselves to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom you spake, is he yet alive? I know you know that this is right at Joseph's heart. He's wanting to hear the results. And they answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He's yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep and entered into his chamber and wept there. You know what he did? He had to get out of their presence. He wanted to weep in private. He did not want them to see his sadness or his joy of seeing Benjamin. His little brother, there he was, standing before him. And verse 31, after he had wept, he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. And they set on for him by himself, for them by themselves, and for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews. I thought, what a coincidence. It was the exact opposite in the New Testament when you find the people of God didn't want to eat with the heathen. Here it is, the heathen didn't want to eat with the people of God. Amazing. For this is an abomination even unto, or unto the Egyptians. And they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men marveled one at another. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him, and Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with can you imagine? I read that, and, I, and I'm just sitting there thinking all the time. I wanted to stop about a dozen times and say something. But I think you need the whole story, at least in capsule form. Can you imagine Joseph's position of power now that he had? It could have been payback time from him. He could have put them all in prison and never let anybody go home. He could have got his vengeance in every sense of the word. And probably from a human perspective, that would have been... Well, you know, they had it coming. Wait a minute. You don't understand what God's doing here. We'll get to the rest of the story. I don't have time for it all tonight. We get to the rest of the story. God is providing for Jacob in advance. He's got the sword laid up. He's got everything taken care of. Not only that, he's about to restore unto him his son Joseph. And yet it seems like everything in the world is going wrong with Jacob and his family. Here's the thing that if you don't get anything else from this short, wonderful story, you need to understand that the only place in this world there's any peace or protection or blessings is in the will of God no matter how they look at the time. Did you hear what I said? It's not always going to be, and no matter what anybody tells you, there's going to be times in your life that you wonder where in the world is God. Can you imagine how Jacob said, oh my word, I've got to take my, my, my youngest son, here I am again. Right, I wonder where God is in all this stuff. And this is the part that I think that we have bought into things in, the, in, in our New Testament, quote, human Christianity together, that all of a sudden we think if anything's happening bad with somebody, they must be out of whack with God. Surely, if we examine this little quick story here, We'd have had to say, my goodness, this is just all people that are walking away from God, people that are not. God had provided for his people. In advance, in the midst of all this difficulty, had he not allowed Joseph to be where he is, guess what could have happened to all the people of Israel? God provided through difficulties. So the next time things get, and by the way, if you think that it's easy to give God in all things, thanks. It's not. But does that make it wrong? No, it makes it right. How can we do that? I, I'm, I'm being very honest right here. There's been times in my life I, I couldn't say, God, thank you for this. 
Have y'all ever had anything to happen you could? Well, you know what you know what the Bible says as well as I do. In all things, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Unless we recognize, here's the problem: unless we recognize God's sovereignty in our life, we'll always think we're in control, even of God, and we're not. God, how can I say this? God doesn't owe us anything. What comes from God is mercy and grace. And God loves us, but it doesn't mean that God's going to keep us from having difficulties. It's going to happen in life. And many times, as difficult as it is to see, as it is in this one story, God has a plan that we don't know about. And it doesn't make the thing we're going through. I'll guarantee you, if you could talk to Jacob during the time when his son, they thought his son was dead, my goodness, Jacob would have said, God forsook us. I wonder what he saw when he got back and he saw Joseph was still alive 22 years later. I got a feeling Jacob says, Lord, forgive me for doubting you, but I'm human after all. Don't use that phrase. I've heard people say, well, God, you know, I'm only human. God knows everything about you. You don't need to tell him anything. What you're recounting is the fact that you have weaknesses, and he knows that, amen? He knows that. But the sovereignty of God is just, when we don't have a high view of the sovereignty of God, we don't have a view of God, because he is, in fact, in control, amen? And he doesn't have to do things according to my calendar. And by the way, he hardly ever does. Y'all ever have to have? I got to. I got to share this, brother Chuck. When he first talked to me about retiring, I couldn't help but laugh. I couldn't help. Here's what I mean by that. And he used the wrong word because he knew he wasn't retired. There's no such thing as retiring. But he he had changed positions. <laughs> I'm trying to say something to you. As long as you've got breath in your life, you are obligated to be a servant of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. He may change what you're doing. But I got to tell you, and by the way, you don't get too, too old. God didn't let Abraham get out of the gate till he was 75. That encourages me. I'm almost there. So this, this so much in this little story. Please read the rest of it. And it's just glorious to me. And that's why I read through it quickly. Because I wanted you to get the impact of how difficult it is sometimes when you're these, these men were walking with God. Joseph didn't do anything to cause all this from one prison to the next. And yet he went from prison to palace. That was God's idea. And Jacob, here's the father, who was a victim of his own sons. The things that he went through. I, I just want to encourage you. If you're going through difficulty, and there's no difficulty this easy, I, I wish you could be encouraged just a little bit. And I don't know what God's plan and everybody's difficulties is, but I can tell you if you belong to Him, God has a purpose in everything that's going on. Not many of you can say amen, but we. He does. He does. And I pray that the Lord will encourage you in the middle of yours. I don't have it as bad as, as, as Jacob had it, at least not right now. Somewhere, only God knows. Anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah, me either. <laughs> when, I get, when I get through this, and when I get, when I get, uh, these are events. These are not stories. These are things that actually happen to real people. Sometimes we read the Bible like a book of mythology, and and you know, it's a, it's a, well, you know, I don't. If today things are different, no, no, we breathe just like he breathed, breathed. We feel just like he felt. We have all the same things that he did, and there's no difference in us and him or any of the rest of it in the Bible. If you really get the feeling down, read the book of Job. And you'll, and you'll come out saying, oh, me. But I can tell you this. Please don't misunderstand me. Yes, ma'am. Only brother by Rachel, his mother. Yeah, there was only two. Yes, ma'am. Right, by Rachel. Right, those were Rachel was Jacob's favorite, of course, as you well know, and Joseph and Benjamin were his favorite because they were they were also the younger of the bunch. So, 
But the one thing that I do want to, I guess this was so important to me, is that I, I've never seen a time when as many people are hurting as they are right now. My phone rings constantly with, with heartaches, hurts. Real things, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about people that sometimes their lives are just ripped apart. And I, I don't always, I don't have the answers. I do, I do have one answer. And that's if you really belong to God. And, and I don't say this tritely because I know you're going to go through some tough times. You really are. But there's not one you'll have to go through by yourself. He promised I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And, and there's sometimes you'll feel like you're forsaken beyond a shadow of a doubt. But you just remember God would not lie. He's telling you the truth. So be encouraged. And, and let's, uh, let's get the Joseph attitude, I guess. Because, you know, Joseph is sitting there for two years waiting on a, a doggone butler to get him out of jail. You know, that he promised he'd do it. Anyway, hopefully there will be something in here tonight that will encourage your life and, and get you started off and get you over the hump, whatever it is you got. And while you're getting over the hump, reach back and help me over mine. How's that? All right. All right, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Brother Bill Wheat, would you close us in prayer, please?